go from here today raising our hands saying, God, pick me, pick me, so that our testimony will be one that will change the world for Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be seated if you would, please. And we're going to go into the report. That's one of the reasons why we also wanted to start a little bit earlier. And uh, so let me talk just briefly, because one of the questions that often comes up is, what is a church consultation? I like to remind people that almost every one of the Apostle Paul's letters was a church consultation. So when he uh, wrote to the Corinthians or to the Ephesians or to the Philippians, he said to the church, keep doing this. You're doing a good job in this area. But stop doing this. This, is, uh, this isn't working. Or commend this person or tell this person they need to you know, do things differently. And so most of Paul's letters were church consultations because he understood and the apostles understood that even though the church was relatively young, we always needed to have some course corrections. So in a sense, that's what we have been doing with your church this weekend. That's what we've been doing with other churches. Another metaphor that may be of help to you is a church consultation is like going to your physician for an annual checkup. My wife tells me I have to go every year, and since I do whatever she says, I go every year. Okay. And... Uh, the doctor runs all the tests. In fact, I just had mine this last week. But I had to go a couple weeks before to get blood so they could look at different issues in the blood. They check the eyes, the heart, the lungs, the whole thing. And when we get all done, the doctor says to me, here's where you're healthy. And I like to hear that. And the problem is, the older I get, the shorter that list becomes. But she tells me, here's where I'm healthy. But then she says to me, here's where there's either disease or potential for disease. Now, the minute my doctor says that to me, my response is, what do I do about it? So about 15 years ago, the doctor I was going to then for my annual checkup said to me, Paul, your cholesterol is too high and you have the wrong kind. You never have the right kind. You have the wrong kind. And began to tell me about all the problems of high cholesterol. So immediately I said, what do I do? He said, well, change your diet and exercise. I said, are there any other options? <laughs> He said, well, if you take this pill and it does not hurt your liver negatively, then that too will control your cholesterol. So I've been proving there's better living through chemistry. <laughs> so in a little while, in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to give you a report that is out, really the results of the consultation. And in there, we're going to share with you what we think are the top five strengths of your church. Your church has a lot of strengths. We're just picking the top five. And to say, here's what we think is the best part. This is where you're the healthiest. Then we're going to share with you the top five concerns. This is where there's, like the doctor says, either disease or potential for disease. And then we have written prescriptions for every one of the concerns. For us to go to a church and say that you're doing this wrong and never tell you how to fix it just isn't right at that point. Now, I want to share with you just briefly, however, the basis behind how, of what I believe as I work with a church. So here's the first thing I believe. That which is healthy grows and reproduces. I have a daughter who has three little girls. At one time, they were all under the age of six. She lives in Denver. We live in Sacramento, California. And when we would communicate, and she would say, I just got back from the pediatrician. As a proud grandfather, I would ask two questions. How much weight has the baby gained? And how many inches has the baby grown? Physicians weigh infants and measure infants because they understand that growth is the best sign of health. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. Your church is abnormal. Most churches in the United States are not growing. In fact, 85 to 90 percent of all churches in the United States are either in plateau or decline. About 50 years ago, there used to be about 500,000 congregations in the U.S. Today, there's about 320, 330 congregations. 4,000 churches a year close in the United States. Uh, I never thought I would have part of my job when I was with California that I had funeral services for churches. They're not pleasant. I'd rather have a funeral service for a believer because at least with a believer, the hope is they've gone ahead. 
But when you get down to five, 10, 15 people they can't afford it, you gotta close, that's not, not, not a pleasant thing. Your church has begun to grow again. That makes you abnormal. Good, that's a good abnormality. But makes you good. Okay. So there is more health here than there used to be. How do we know that? Your church is beginning to grow. However, the assumption is that which is healthy grows and reproduces. Most of the growth that has come have been from other Christians who've come from other churches to your church. In other words, you're doing a good job of rearranging sheep. Just that's how your church has been growing. And we're glad those people are here. I hope you're glad those people are here. But the church has not been doing the process of reproducing new Christians or multiplying, making new Christians, or to use Jesus' word of make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I, mean, the whole, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, the church of Jesus Christ is one generation away from extinction. Because if our generation doesn't make disciples, then the church dies. And so one of the things that the church, your church needs to work on is how do we continue to grow, but grow in such a way that we are doing it by making more disciples for Jesus Christ. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption you heard in the sermon, and that is I believe Jesus did not create the church for Christians, but to mobilize us as Christians to reach lost people. In Matthew 16, Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. And I believe in the next line, he tells us why. So the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build the church so all the Christians can get together on Sunday and have wonderful worship. I'm going to build my church so every all the Christians can get together on Sunday and hear great preaching. And many of you spoke about how much you really appreciated your pastor's preaching. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build the church so we can all get together on Sunday and have great fellowship. By the way, you have not disappointed me. I have yet to meet the second friendliest church in town. Every church I meet tells me it's the friendliest church in town. Which means that if friendliness grew churches, the churches in the United States ought to be booming. But they're not. Now, that doesn't mean you want to be the most hostile church in town. Don't, don't go the other way. Okay. What it does mean is that when people, you walk in and you are friendly, people are saying, well, gee, we expect the church to be friendly. Like when my son was five, he said, Dad, can I get an allowance for brushing my teeth? And I said, no. That's just what you do. You're supposed to be friendly. But here's what Jesus said. Now, worship's important. Preaching's important. Fellowship is important. But Jesus said, I'm building my church. Because the church's job is to depopulate Satan's zip code. Hell is not to win. And in our nation, hell is winning because churches have stopped for the most part of making disciples for Jesus Christ. Okay. So that's the second assumption. Third assumption. The gospel never changes, but the church must change constantly. Now, I've done this long enough. I'm 73. I, you know, change is hard. Yeah, it's hard. People don't like change. Yeah, by the way, that's not an age issue. I meet a lot of young people who don't like change. I meet a lot of older people who don't like change. But by the way, folks, I hope you realize we're all changing whether we like it or not. Most churches are slowly declining. They're getting stoned to death with popcorn. Just little change after little change after little change. When in reality, God says, are you willing to change by obeying me to see people come to Jesus? And so as you look at the church for 2,000 years, the, God is constantly seeing the church change. And so we're going to talk about some changes. But the change is not just for the sake of change. Change is to say, how can a church that is now beginning to grow, and by the way, you're beginning to grow because you made some changes. We had, we've interviewed a lot of people. We heard how before your current pastor was here that this was not a pleasant place to be. In fact, we heard, we talked to people who even sometimes were for a while left because it just wasn't a pleasant place to be. Now we talk to everybody, this is a place like Disneyland. It's the happiest place on earth. <laughs> That's a change. 
Okay? You, and, and that change happened because of some things your pastor did. Okay? So, that which is healthy grows or reproduces. Jesus did not create the church for Christians, but to mobilize Christians to reach lost people. And the gospel never changes, but the church must change constantly. And then we talk to your church about where you are as a church on your current life cycle. Folks, most churches I work with are on the downside of life cycle. All of us. Every living thing has a life cycle. I have a life cycle. I'm 73 and I'm looking at some of you around here and some of you are joining me on that final glide path. My life cycle's coming to an end. And the only way the Bible says my life cycle is going to get changed is with the resurrection of Jesus. This isn't doing that now, not even for Pentecostalists. <laughs> the good news for churches is unlike us, we only get one life cycle. Churches can have multiple life cycles. And you're one of the first churches I worked with in a long time that had been on the downside of the life cycle. Many of you talked about the fact that the fear that this church was at uh, someday not going to survive that's begun to grow again, and you have started a new life cycle. And so the report we've given you is to say, how do we take that which God is doing? Because only God grows the church. Pastors don't grow churches. Missionaries don't grow churches. Consultants don't grow churches. Only God grows the church. So how do we help a church take what God is doing and enhance it so God can do much more through this church? So that's what's been behind the weekend. So I'm going to ask... The elders, some of the session members are in the back. Would you give out the reports at this point? And uh, some of you come near the front and start back, and others. Uh... <laughs> If you haven't got a report, raise your hand so some of the others can help get some of the reports. So we, we've got enough for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So there's some people up here in the front that have gotten that kind of report. Chuck, if you're behind you up here, there's some people. There's still about four people up here. Great, thank you. All right, if you follow along, I'm going to go through the report and do some explanation of what, why we have written what we have written. So number one are the strengths. Number one, the pastor. Pastor Jason Shep has served with excellence as the pastor for the last 10 years. Under his leadership, the church is growing and reaching families with children and teens. Many spoke highly of his sermons and their practical applications. Now, I want to tell you, just because Jason is your pastor does not mean he's here that's not automatic to get on this report. In fact, I do reports where sometimes we don't even mention the pastor. But I want to tell you, folks, the reason why you are growing again is because God has brought to you a leader who is doing the right stuff to help your church grow. I hope you understand, and you probably don't because you don't see a lot of other churches, the kind of pastor you have is rare. Most pastors are leading their church down. Your pastor is leading your church to grow. That's a rare gift. Okay. Number two, resources. The congregation is blessed with a number of key resources, including a very good pastor, more people. You got, that's, that's your most important resource, more people, no debt, and close to $300,000 in finances. Folks, you, God, God's blessed you now. Uh, as I said to the, to the session, I hope Jesus doesn't come back tomorrow because... You know, what are you going to do? Give them the 300000 I think I'll take it. Okay, all right. So anyway, number three, a new atmosphere. The morale of the congregation is higher than it has been in an exceptionally long time. Not only is there new growth, a renewed commitment to mission, but an atmosphere that is essentially free from gossip and criticism. That makes your church rare, I will guarantee you. Number four, open to change. The leaders reported that the congregation has been open to a variety of changes over the last decade. Some of the key changes are in facilities, in how worship is conducted, and a renewed commitment to experimenting in mission ventures. Again, that makes you rare as a church. I hope, I hope you understand these folks, you, you are good at normal. Okay. Number five, verbal commitment to the Great Commission. 
Many in the church, including the pastor in session, understand that God has not blessed this congregation to enjoy his blessings of the last decade. But that God has blessed this congregation to bless others by helping lost people become new disciples of Jesus Christ. One of the problems that you now have as a church is you're big enough. You've got enough people here. You've got enough money here to say, oh, this is a nice place. We don't need any more people. I lived for, in Denver, Colorado for 20 years. About 20 miles north of Denver is Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado is a beautiful place to live. But all the people who have now moved to Boulder don't want anybody else to come in there. So if you're a contractor, you cannot get a water tap because Boulder has become a closed community. And it's amazing the number of churches I come into that are act like Boulder. We've got a nice building, we've got a great pastor, we've got all this stuff. We don't want anybody else to come because they're going to mess things up. That's not why Jesus created the church. And your leaders understand that. Now, here are concerns. Evangelism. To this point, a verbal commitment to evangelism has not resulted in the making of new disciples for Jesus Christ. As far as we can tell, everybody we ask, I think one person came to Christ through the life of your congregation in the last 12 months. What's your budget round numbers? 90,000. Okay, say 100,000. It costs you 90 to 100,000 to make one disciple. If you were in business, you'd be out of business. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing at this point. Number two, mission and vision. The leaders do not make decisions based on a clear mission statement, and there is no clear vision for the church. Number three, structure. The leadership is not structured for health and growth. If there isn't a change in how you function as a church, the growth is going to be stifled. Number four, facilities. The structure of the current facilities is hurting the growth process. And number five, giving. The, the people of the congregation are poor givers. You give about what half of the Presbyterian churches around you and across the country give per person. Okay. Uh, the whole idea of giving, the whole idea of tithing, I mean, many people here treat your waiter at a restaurant much nicer than you treat God in terms of how you give. Okay? That, but that can be addressed. Okay, prescriptions, evangelism. The pastor will call the congregation to a day of prayer. The purpose of this day is to ask God to forgive the congregation both individually and collectively for failing to make new disciples for Jesus Christ on a regular and consistent basis. They will also ask God to give them a broken heart for lost people and a passion to reach out to those who do not know Jesus. They will ask God to give them wisdom in how to become effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. When the Sunday worship service of prayer is over, the congregation will be broken up into groups to prayer drive the community after which all will return to the church for a common meal to share what God taught them as they prayed and then take communion together. That day will occur by January 28, 2018. About four years ago, I was working with a little Wesleyan congregation down in Delaware. Now, I'm from New Jersey, so I have a familiar with the Northeast, but I didn't realize Delaware had so many places that were uninhabited. Uh, do you get Purdue chickens here? Ah. I have found where they all are raised. The whole area stunk the whole weekend. We were there. Chicken farm. Chicken farm all over. This little Wesleyan church of 35 people, the average age was in the 70s. It was the most cluttered church I've ever seen. Old viewers and blankets and just, just, just a dismal place. But this church said, we want to grow. And we want to reach people for Jesus. So we said to them, you better start with getting on your knees and saying, God, forgive us for not obeying you and obeying your great commission. Since most of the congregation was older, and they only had 35 people, when they finished that day of prayer, the pastor had rented a school bus. And the entire congregation went out and got in the school bus. And they began to drive to chicken farms all around the community. And they go by a chicken farm and somebody would say, I know the people who live there, they don't go to church and they would pray for that family. They go by another chicken farm and somebody would say, oh, I know the people who don't go there, they would pray for them. They got by the school, an elementary school, and they said, they named three or four teachers. They don't go to church, let's pray for them. They went by the service stage, they had two pumps. They went by the service stage, it was always open on Sunday, uh, and they prayed for the people there. And God began to change the heart of that church. And within two years, that church of 35 was a church of 70. And people were not only coming to church, they were coming to Jesus, and God was beginning to change what was happening. 
Of all the prescriptions we're giving you, from my perspective, this is the most important because this is about the heart. You joined ECO because you said we're committed to the Word of God and we want to see churches flourishing. At least that's what ECO says they're about. And this is the time to say, all right, God, we want to be one of the churches in ECO. That not only says we're committed to the Word of God, but we're actually going to be a church that does the Word of God. And that's why this day is so important. And either the month of February or March of 2018, the pastor will preach four sermons on the contagious church, teaching people how to be an inviting congregation. From the Sunday of prayer through June 2018, all the pastor's sermons will be about mission, vision, evangelism from the book of Acts or Jesus' ministry in the Gospels. I've been working with a church in Carthage, Missouri. And if you don't know where that is, don't worry about it. Don't go there. It's not worth your time. But anyway, Carthage, Missouri. I'm sorry, if anybody from Missouri, I'll speak more slowly. <laughs> um, the pastor, every time I'm with the pastor, I've been with him twice now, once for breakfast and once for lunch. We sit down, the wait person comes over. Hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm the pastor of that church. In a moment, I'm going to give thanks for the food. Uh, is there anything I can pray for you for? And I've been amazed. How, no matter how busy the wait person is, they stop. I said, well, would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? So I, I talked to him one day. I said, do you do that all the time? He says, oh, yeah. I said, why? He said, well, about every fourth, fifth, sixth time as I walk out of the restaurant, that wait person comes over and says to me, can we meet again? I need to talk to you about some things that are really spiritual. He says, I have a whole opportunity to begin to develop a relationship and lead them to Jesus. Well, now his whole board, he's training. The board does it. I was talking, one of the board members said uh, Every Sunday when I come to church, I stop at a convenience store for coffee because the coffee there is better than the church coffee. So he says, I stopped for coffee. He said, I went in the convenience store, I bought this cup of coffee, came out, got in my car, started the car, and I thought, I haven't done what the pastor asked me. So he said, I went back, he said, there was nobody in the store, and I said to the guy, I said, you may not recognize me, but I'm here every Sunday morning, I recognize you. Is there anything I can pray for you for? Because I'm going to church. And the man said, well, would you pray for this and pray for this? Uh, and then... Uh, he said, every Sunday I go back, and every time I go back, he has another prayer request for me. And I begin to develop a relationship with him. I worked with a church recently in Queens, New York. Now, Queens, New York is not your world. Queens, New York is urban. In fact, this church said, we have been watching all the churches from Manhattan out to Queens, almost to Long Island. They're all dying, and we're wondering if we're the last one. And they had this Sunday of prayer. Now, because of being Queens, there were a whole group of African-American people lived on this side. There were Indians who lived across the street from India. There were the uh, Anglos on this side. And they took, began to, they prayer walk. They didn't have to drive. And there was one of the elders in the church that didn't want to go on the day of prayer. The pastor said, hey, Paul. He said, well, who am I going to be? He said, your group's going to go with all the restaurants and businesses with the Indian people across the street. He said, I don't even like their food. He said, that doesn't matter. You can pray for them. <laughs> He said, they started praying in front of every store. They got in front of this restaurant. And they're praying. And the owner comes out. He says, what are you doing? He said, we're praying for you. He said, we're from the church up the street. We just want to love you. We're just praying for you. And the owner said, I can't believe this. He said, half the Indians here are sheiks. The other half are Hindus and not neither. And they're constantly giving me a hard time. And he wherever he shut the door, and, and the, they said, what are you doing? He says, uh, I'm locking my door because I'm going to go back to church with you. I want to come to that church that thinks enough of me to pray for me. Okay. So we need to learn how to invite people, how to pray for people. The pastor will train his staff in session to share the gospel. By September 1, 2018, all session and staff members will share their faith with an unbeliever once a month, and the pastor will do it twice a month. The session and staff are all going to be volunteers. So I said, your pastor is paid to be good. Everybody else is good for nothing, but you still have to do the good. <laughs> On the three Sundays before the Alaska trip, he will use the sermon time to train the entire congregation in how to engage unbelievers and have spiritual conversations with them. While the team is in Alaska, the prayer pastor will set up a prayer virgil, vigil by the congregation to be praying that God will use the team to lead many to Jesus Christ. Folks, it is awesome that you're sending 54 people to Alaska, but you need to see, this is your church's project. It's not just the 54 people. I was working with a church in Portland, and they were going to go next Sunday to a big festival the city of Portland was having in this 
big park and they were all going to take different picnic tables and, and talk to people who sat down at the picnic table and, and try to engage them in spiritual conversations and the pastor knew none of them knew how to do it. So the Sunday before, for, actually for a couple of Sundays before, up on the platform every Sunday morning was a great big picnic table. And the sermon was the pastor or somebody else would sit me here and they'd have three other or four other people sit around the table who were playing the roles of non-Christians. What do you do if all of them are sitting there saying, oh yeah, we go to, we go to church, but you know they never, how do you engage them? What if, if, this is Oregon, so they, most of them be atheists or agnostics, you know, or Hindus, and they're sitting around and they show the people how to do it. That needs to be happening so that you become not only an inviting church, but a church where people feel comfortable sharing their faith with Jesus Christ. Number two, mission and vision. On the day this report is accepted, should that be the case, the new mission statement of Eastbrook will be, Eastbrook Presbyterian Church exists to make disciples of Jesus Christ who make disciples. That's why we're here. The pastor will lead his staff to conduct a mission ministry audit of every ministry in the congregation. Those ministries that do not help the church conduct the mission must be changed so they do, or they will be canceled or run by leaders who help the mission be achieved. So, you go through every ministry of the church and say, all right, if we're here to make disciples, how's this ministry helping to make disciples? How's this ministry helping to make disciples? How's this? And if the ministry isn't, then that ministry has to. Why do you do that ministry? So, I'm, whether it's a Sunday school class, whether it's the worship team, whatever. I was in a church that had a woman's ladies ministry that went through this audit. The women would do 10 things a year. 30 to 50 women would show up every time they did something, which sounds like it's a great ministry until they say, who are the women showing up? Well, it was either women from that church or other churches in the community. The women's ministry was not helping make new disciples for Jesus. So they went to the women. They said, you know, we, we don't want to cancel the ministry. And the women said, we've already thought about this. Let me tell you what we're going to do. Three times a year, our event, our women's event, is going to be a banquet. We're going to put on the best spread that we can, even if we have to cater it. This is not going to be your typical potluck supper with a lime jello with a pear on the bottom and a green bean casserole. Okay. Or where the three people who are ahead of the pastor eat all the dead legs. I, there's no anger here, but I just want you to know that. They said, we're going to sell tickets. <coughs> Now, the tickets are not to cover the cost of the dinner because the tickets will be quite inexpensive. But the purpose of the ticket is you can't get in without a ticket. However, when you go to a lady in the church who's selling the tickets, you cannot buy one ticket. You must buy two tickets and give her the name of the unchurched woman you've invited to come with you. Because when the dinner is over, we're going to ask a lady from our church or an outside speaker to stand up and share about her faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe invite the women there to follow her as she is following Jesus Christ. So what the women said, seven times a year the ministry is going to be for us. But three times a year we're going to be involved in the mission of the church. And we're saying that has to happen for every ministry in the church. The next thing is at the bottom of that first paragraph in 2018 the church will conduct three bridge events that follow the training provided during the consultation weekend. One of the things your church is doing, you're doing a lot of big things in the community, but you're getting the same response I hear from most churches. We do this big event, whether it's the Slip and Slide, the Harvest Festival, we're at the state, at the fair, and we talk to a lot of people, but nobody ever comes to church. And so we provided training yesterday about how do you do these events, not only to get people there, but to connect them to the church where you begin to see people come into the church because they've had contact with you in terms of those big events. The next paragraph, the pastor will lead the congregation to establish two numbers, both of which are faith goals. The first will be the number of people that the congregation wants to see become new disciples in the next five years through their efforts. The second is the number the congregation wants to touch with Jesus' love over the next five years. These two numbers will be the focus of the congregation's vision. And here's your new vision statement. A heart for the moral area. This vision will be in place by March 1st, 2018. Your Jerusalem, the Jerusalem God has given you, is this area you call moral. And so the question is, if we're going to make disciples, what's the vision? What's it look like? How many how many do we want to see come to Jesus? How many people in this area do we want to touch with Jesus' love? 
You see, most churches are like Charlie Brown, who shoots the arrow on the fence and then paints the target around it and says, I hit the target. We're saying, no, set a target, a faith goal to say, God, because when you set that target, you will strategize to reach that target. Number three, structure. The session will offer their pastor a halftime position beginning January 1, 2018. Folks, you've got a winner. It's time to bring them on board fully. Okay? The position will become full-time October 1, 2018. The money for his total package will either be raised from the congregation or taken out of the reserves the church currently has. The pastor will submit to the session how he intends to use the extra time he will now give to the church, recognizing that the majority of that time is to be dedicated to growing the congregation, not ministering to the people who already attend. This means focusing on reaching out to community leaders, helping the church adopt the high school as a key focus of ministry, and finding ways to open doors of ministry for new connections in the community. His church responsibilities will be focused on leading the staff, developing leaders, and initiating the small group. The pastor, in conjunction with his coach, will submit a plan for his personal growth and development. This plan will be in place by April 1, 2018. I was working with a pastor in Australia, in a city of about 400,000. And this is to show you the kinds of things that can happen as pastors begin to make connections. And under his leadership, because he was connecting with people across the community, the church sent out an invitation to over 700 emergency services people, policemen, firemen, uh, people who work in emergency wards on Friday and Saturday nights at the hospitals. And they invited them to the church for a special Sunday to honor them and to thank them for what they did. On that Sunday, 70 people showed up. They had him stand up on the platform. The pastor stood and he said to these people, on behalf of the congregation, I just want to uh, say thank you. Often, every day, you're risking your lives for us. Thank you. In fact, we have written a prayer for you. And so he prayed that prayer as everybody bowed their heads. They had taken a copy of that prayer and framed it and gave a copy to all 70 people standing on the platform. And then before those people sat down, the pastor said, we have made a vow this year that every week for the next 52 weeks, somewhere in the life of our church, we will pray for you. I was with the pastor a year later. He said, Paul, a few months after that, we had a new family join our church. The first time they'd ever been in church was when the father had stood on the platform as a fireman. And on the way home, their 10-year-old in the back seat said, Mommy, Daddy, I'm never going to be scared when Daddy goes on a run again because that church is praying for him. And you need to have a pastor who's having those connections with the community to begin to develop those kinds of relationships. The pastor will hire a children's ministry leader for 15 to 20 hours a week. This person's initial focus will be on developing the children's church to be an even greater ministry experience for children. This person will be in place by July 1st, 2018. Folks, uh, 